Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jay, and we're so excited to have you here at our LGBTQIA speaker series event for September 2020. Thank you all so much for being here and get ready to learn something new. I wanted to start with a quick overview of the speaker series. So the LGBTQ Center started the speaker series with the goal of providing faculty, staff, and graduate and professional students a forum in which to make connections around and share research and pedagogy addressing sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. The hope was to create a community of scholars addressing these areas, ideally from a very intersectional perspective. That's still the primary goal of the series. It also was to serve as a place for people to share developing work or gain experience presenting in preparation for submission of material to regional or national conferences. It remains a forum for that as well. Today, we're so excited to have Caitlin Campbell, who uses she and her pronouns, here today to present for our speaker series. Caitlin's work is concerned with lesbian feminist placemaking and relationships to land and settler colonialism in the 1970s. Caitlin is a third year PhD student in the American Studies program at UNC and an alumna of Wellesley College and the 2016 Harry S. Truman Scholar from West Virginia. She lives in Chapel Hill with her feline companion, Theodore. Please give your undivided attention to the awesome Caitlin. Okay. Thank you so much, Jay. And I'm gonna figure out how to make you host now, Caitlin, and... There we go. Awesome. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. If you will holler, if you can see this, Jay, that'd be great. I can, yes. All right, can you still see? Yep, I can. Awesome. Well, hello everyone, and thanks so much again to, to Jay and all the folks at the LGBTQ Center, and as well as anybody who is supportive of this amazing QGAPS programming for having me here today to talk about some of this research. Um, having, I, got, I had the privilege of getting to do a little bit of research um, to write a history of queer life at UNC as part of um, my RA-ship with the Sexuality Studies program about a year ago. And knowing that I get to be in um, the great company of such amazing folks from the LGBTQ Center and knowing some of the work that they do um, really makes this even more of an honor and a privilege um, to get to talk about some of my research here. So like Jay said, my name is Caitlin Campbell and I use she and her pronouns. And I'm a third year PhD student in American Studies here at UNC. Um, and what I'm here to talk about today is some work that I did for my master's thesis which I just defended this past spring in April. So really about a month into um, the quarantine in which we presently find ourselves. And I'm interested in the pains and promises of lesbian feminism broadly. And lesbian feminism is a politics that's often thought about as having utopian aspirations, but like most utopian projects, falls short in some critical ways. I call this project Radical Visions in keeping with the concept of the vision proposed by environmentalist Danella Meadows. Meadows described visionary statements and actions as being different from predictions or declarations of political impossibility. She wrote that visions come from our innate sense of what is right and good, and that they articulate a future that someone deeply wants and do it so clearly and compellingly that they summon up the energy, agreement, sympathy, political will, creativity, resources, or whatever to make that future happen. It's a truth by repetition truth, but of a special powerful kind. In other words, visions are the fantasies of a different world that take on new powerful forms when they're spoken into existence. And the visions I engage with are ones that exist in, di with, in dialogue with questions and problematics posed in the material world um, by a groundswell of radical feminism in the United States in the long 1970s. And I see these visions as being critical to understanding both the pains and promises of lesbian feminism. Um, and in thinking about our own radical imaginations, lesbian feminists or otherwise today. Um, so I also want to recognize uh, thinking about utopia and dystopia that we're presently in a moment where our the 
dystopia of our present world is clear and very high relief. Um, so I want to also start by thanking you all, the audience, uh, for being here today um, to engage with some of these ideas that um, might bring some hope. Um, but there are, you know, there are pains and promises in this talk. Um, but sort of with our shifting world and circumstances in mind, I want to invite you all to participate as your full embodied selves. Um, so if you need to get up and walk around during this talk, lay on the floor, feed yourself or someone who lives with you, et cetera, um, please feel free to do those things and join back with us. So I wanna start um, with a question, a sort of an invocation, then I'll tell you a little bit more about me or how I came to be here. And I, I wanna ask, what would your ideal world look like? And that's something you can ponder now. If you can close your eyes if you want, keep them open. Then I wanna ask, you know, is this world in the past? in the present? Is it in the future? What's the environment like? Is your ideal world at the beach? Maybe in the room you are now, you're in now, in the mountains? Are there any physical structures there? What do they look like? And finally, what, what's keeping this ideal world from being possible right now? Or what, what are the things that are in your way of making these things happen? These are some sort of visioning questions I want to carry with us. And you'll see in a moment how they're connected to some of the lesbian feminist work. Um, but I, I hope that this is a helpful grounding question um, to help organize some of our thinking that we'll sort of embark on together in the next about 40 minutes. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in West Virginia in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and one of my favorite things to do as a kid was to play a game called Rock the Box. And um, my mom has an identical twin sister and her kids are around the same age as my younger sister, Molly and I. And when we were in elementary school, we read this book called Rock the Box about a group of kids and during the Great Depression um, who make fantastical worlds um, for themselves in a desert using boxes, sticks and rocks. And like a lot of little kids, uh, we had pretty active imaginations uh, and played out different ideas about um, power and our values in these pretend worlds that we made uh, together. My mom is supposed to be at this talk, so she will be entertained uh, and <laughs> remembering the countless hours that we spent playing Rocks of Oxen. Um, but eventually all of us got a little bit older and we stopped uh, engaging in this kind of imaginative play. Um, but you know, life continues to happen. And despite the fact that we weren't using this imaginary space anymore for fantasy, um, each of us was still having to negotiate with power and navigate structures of power in different ways. Um, so I really came into my own as a feminist, as a high school senior, um, when I was involved in some activism around sex education um, and really some pretty regressive um, post-Bush era, Bush era abstinence only policies um, that my public school was using that really um, demonstrated to me the ways that I could not continue to participate in, in my life as normal anymore. Um, and this for me was the, the breaking point moment of finding um, some comfort, but also discomfort in an emergent feminist consciousness. Um, and I'll say that I first came to lesbian feminism as an undergraduate at Wellesley College in Paul Fisher's queer literature course um, when I was thinking about how I could reconcile my identity as a queer femme um, with my lifelong commitment to the state of West Virginia and the land there and how I could balance all these different commitments. Um, so for me, um, lesbian feminism has been somewhat of an inspiration. Um, but as a graduate student, of course, I, I think it, it, you like see, look at the things that are inspiring to you, but also um, do some work of deconstructing them to find uh, the places where you might improve. So th th these are kind of the places where I'm beginning this talk today. So this leads, leads to the question, or I think what we're asking a lot of this feminist work is what would the world look like as a phys physical manifestation of feminist consciousness? Um, what would this feminist imaginary do if it, if and when it emerges in the material world? And a good place to start thinking about this question is um, with Noel Phyllis Birkby, who's a feminist architect whose papers I sort of stumbled upon during a research trip to Smith College in um, summer 2019, seems like a lifetime ago. 
And while Phyllis Birkby was at the height of her career as an architect, just as the women's liberation movement began its radical turn in the early 70s, when she began to publicly consider what it would take to liberate the built environment from patriarchy by design. Birkby knew from her work as an architect that patriarchy and architecture have a fraught and intertwined relationship, shaping the world around herself and others and defining the border between possible and impossible. Particularly because of the predominantly male makeup of the architectural and planning professions, Berkby argued that women had become detached from the creation of the built environment, even as it quietly shaped their day-to-day -day lives. As she wrote in a 1977 article for feminist publication, Heresies, to some extent, all women are conditioned by the dominant culture, but they usually don't see themselves as creators of the built environment. However, all women experience it, react to it, live and work in it, and are affected by it, consciously or not. For Birkby, liberation from the patriarchal built environment through the imagination and construction of alternative feminist environments was a critical project for the development of a radical feminist consciousness and for manifesting a utopian vision where the existence of patriarchy would be rendered physically impossible. The first step in, that, in this process was to begin to conceptualize structures and structural arrangements that serve women's needs and desires first while limiting the influence of masculinist architectural training. Alongside professional partner, Leslie Keynes Weissman, she developed a traveling workshop entitled Women in the Built Environment, pictured here, in which female non-architect participants, and she was pretty insistent that these people not be, participants not be trained as architects in what she viewed as masculinist architecture schools, and from across the United States, were asked to draw out their fantasy living environments. And when we get to be together in person again, I would love to draw out some um, fantasy environments together. Berkby and Weissman understood these drawings to be manifestations of genuine feminist architecture. Their practice arose from their experiences as two of very few women working in the architectural profession and their desire to find ways for women to understand themselves as both inhabitants and creators of the built environment. Over the course of nearly a decade, Berkby and Weissman collected hundreds of these drawings alongside meticulous notes on the workshops that invited women to create them many of which are preserved in Berkeley's papers at the Sophia Smith Collection at Smith College. And there are many of these drawings there as well. They're pretty enormous. As Berkeley and Weissman did, I understand these drawings to be manifestations of the desires of the women who created them. And furthermore, assert that they're in inflected with those women's varying experiences and histories, which, we, which they brought with them into the room. So look at some of these. The, um, the image on the left here is, a, is an article that Berkby and Weissman published together, I believe in Heresies, um, talking about the, their ideas about patriotecture, that patriarchy is ingrained into the built environment. Um, but I wanna sort of hone in here on this image on the right, which is a, an image that they published with this article of one of the fantasy drawings. So you'll note that this is labeled as the feminist underground city. Um, the, the architect who drew this described it as being shaped like a womb and in the underground um, that's full of health food, a printing press, a library with tapes, um, it's a women's self-help school, um, sort of these, these tools for sustenance. And the idea for feminist wombs being in every major city across the country. And of course, it's located as the counterbalance to the pinnacles of patriarchy, um, which represent this idea of patriotecture that Berkby and Weissman are talking about, of um, these tall phallic structures that are dominating the landscape. Um, but something that I want to note here um, in this drawing, it certainly draws on essentialist ideas of the womb as being associated with the female or the feminine. Um, but it also I think matters here that this fantasy is imagined as being in the underground. Um, it's a space that's often been reserved for ideas of death or damnation, um, when in fact in this drawing it is the sort of source of sustenance, generation, and regeneration um, that might make some type of feminist uh, revolution possible. There's also a feminist credit union here, which I would be, like love to talk about in the Q&A. So if this is something that interests you and you want to talk about more, please note that. 
So the second fantasy drawing, um, and there are really so many of them that I would be happy to share afterward. Um, this one comes from Alicia, age 24 in Oakland, California, and she self-identifies as uh, working construction. So in, in this image, um, this is a, a fantasy environment that's unfinished. So you can see there's a backhoe over here coming in to do some of the construction work. Um, there are groups of women over here in the mountains. Um, it looks like it's along a beach. This is labeled as the ocean. Um, but I'll also draw your attention to the dome-shaped structures, um, which Berkeley was very interested in, because no matter where she went to do these workshops around the country, um, the participants were often drawing these dome-shaped structures, um, which are kind of the antithesis of, you know, the tall phallic skyscraper. And um, this was something that I don't see as being um, totally resolved in Berkby's work, but certainly uh, is a trend that she noticed, um, and it was not something that she prompted folks to do when they were doing the drawings. So public articulations of utopian thought further require articulations of fantasy. As Judith Butler writes in Undoing Gender, fantasy is part of the articulation of the possible. It moves us beyond what's merely actual and present into a realm of possibility, the not yet actualized or the not actualizable. The critical promise of fantasy, when and where it exists, is to challenge the contingent limits of what will and will not be called reality. Fantasy arises from desire, desire which is often forbidden or kept secret for fear of its existence reaching the wrong ears. Desire exists in relation to the erotic, which is governed by men under the patriarchal regime of compulsory heterosexuality, as Audrey and Rich described it. The work of articulating fantasy by women on women's own terms thus seeks to reclaim both desire and in the space of the erotic from patriarchy to put both domains energy, space and energy to use for feminist purposes. So to share a bit of a piece um, Berkeley and Weissman published about their work, um, they write that we are faced with the task of rebuilding, reordering, restructuring most aspects of our lives, our relationships, institutions, art, spiritual life, and sort of creating supportive environments in which these efforts can take place. We're talking about changing things that are so deeply rooted in our physical and psychic experiences that we will have to dig beneath the roots themselves to break them apart to shake them loose from the soil in which they grew in order to get to what we know we need, not what we think we need. So Phyllis Berkby and Leslie Kane's Weissman's work is emerging from um, the strain of lesbian feminism that's I think most clearly articulated by a group called the Radical Lesbians during a ZAP action called the Lavender Menace at the Second Congress to Unite Women um, in 1970. And during this action, they were trying to bring attention to the fact that lesbians had largely been excluded from the women's movement and regarded by Betty Friedan famously as a lavender menace um, there to undermine the movement and make them less legible to men. So during this action, all folks, uh, including Rita Mae Brown, pictured here, snuck into this event, turned all the lights off, hopped up on stage and started delivering the lesbians' grievances. And along the way, they, they are distributing a pamphlet entitled The Woman Identified Woman where they articulate this clear woman manifesto, um, where they're saying, and it begins, what is a lesbian? A lesbian is the rage of all women condensed to the point of explosion. And they articulate that one of the challenges that women face um, in this political arena is that they are not able to self-define. Um, they're always defining themselves in relation to men. And they call for women to divest from patriarchy, vis-a-vis -vis divesting from men, by redirecting their energy away from men and towards women. Um, so it's a separatist strain of political thought. Um, but this, of course, has a spatial element, which is where some of the work that I do around women's land comes in, um, but also where it becomes complicated, as I'll explicate further here. So one thing I want to say is that consciousness is a really important part of lesbian feminism. And thinking about it for queer theory folks in terms of Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology, lesbian feminism is about understanding how, um, how we can orient ourselves uh, away from um, patriarchy as a structural structure, but rather toward a something else that radical feminism is trying to define. 
So lesbian feminism thus also often engages with practices of consciousness raising. Um, this is about finding moments where women can come together and talk about their lives as a way of understanding the ways in which um, they're oppressed and figuring out you know, what to do about it. Um, so this is a moment when consciousness raising circles are really popular and Phyllis Berkby was actually in many of the same consciousness raising circles as like folks who ran with the radical lesbians uh, when she was in New York. Um, so just to say, like, sort of like the chart in the L word, uh, no one is really like more than six degrees of separation apart from each other. So um, the, this practice of consciousness raising finds itself into some of the form and structure of lesbian feminist novels from around this time. Um, so in the past, I've not been a literature person, but for this, the purpose of this master's thesis, I dove into some of this literary work for the first time um, because my little historian self is also very interested in the connections between the in-person practice of consciousness raising and the literature it inspired. So the first of these novels I look at is uh, The Wanderground, Stories of the Hill Women by Sally Miller Gearhart. It's published in 1979. Um, and it has this pretty remarkable map right inside the front page. And I want to talk a little bit about here. So this is a map of a world in a state of transformation. It's a map of the Wanderground, a space of rebellion, which is separated from danger land by a dark boundary, um, dotted with outposts and bisected by a river. The Wanderground exists in an unspecified future defined by the revolt of the Earth Mother, which rendered the countryside a safe haven for women where men's instruments of control have no power and sexual violence is impossible. Women in the Wanderground reproduce through parthenogenesis, traveling to a subterranean womb-like space, sound familiar, um, to become impregnated and give birth. While younger women in the Wanderground have no personal experience with sexual violence, they're well aware of the need to prevent it. Residents of the Wanderground travel to other subterranean remember rooms to receive transmissions of memories of past acts of violence from their elders so that they never forget the stakes of their safety. The space encapsulated by the map moves from urban to rural across its diagonal with the city located in the deep southwest corner of Dangerland and the high mountains to the far northeast in the Wanderground. Markings across the map denote the locations of female characters we meet throughout the novel, some centuries on the border, others more deeply entrenched in, the rel in their relative regions. It's clear from the first glimpse that the world envisioned in the Wanderground and its surrounding area is comprised of spaces of contestation and struggle. A geographic imaginary constructed to play out fantasies of a world in the process of moving beyond domination. First published as a set of serialized essays across feminist publications such as Ms., Quest, and Woman's Spirit, Wanderground was released as a novel by Persephone Press in 1979. Founded three years prior, Persephone identified itself as a lesbian feminist collective whose goal was to uplift the voices of lesbian writers and affect social change through both their published works and the growing network of people who read them. Wanderground is generally understood to be a fictional representation of the possibilities and challenges of women's land, radical lesbian feminist projects that seek to reclaim space for women through both temporary and permanent land projects. And yet, despite its similarities to the realities of women's land, the utopian project of the Wanderground is rendered more complete by the fantastical rejection of patriarchy by the earth itself, removing barriers to a world otherwise foreclosed by the confines of materiality outside of the imaginary. So um, the Wanderground is pretty, actually pretty similar to another earlier feminist utopian work by Charlotte Perkins Gilman um, called Her Land, um, which was published in the late 19th century, but sort of sort similar to the Wanderground in serial, but revived by the feminist press actually in the same year that the Wanderground is published. Um, and one of those similarities is pretty notable between the two of them is the reproduction through parthenogenesis. Um, but one troubling similarity between these two um, is the, I mean, Charlotte Perkins Gilman was a eugenicist. Um, and both of these um, utopian imaginaries involve an unspoken uh, white, white su subject identity here um, that 
to force, force this utopian imaginary to rely on um, a, a eugenicist logic of um, racial erasure and sort of un, an unspoken genocide. Um, so this is a, a moment also where it's important to think when you're considering these utopian examples, um, are a utopia for whom? Um, and to what extent does the existence of um, the, the wander ground or her land uh, rely on a nightmare for someone else? Which we'll pick up on some more nightmares here in a moment. So the, the second novel that I look at in the thesis um, is The Female Man by Joanna Russ. And this is a, a novel that's more like clearly situated within sci-fi. Um, so Joanna Russ was amongst a group of lesbian feminist thinkers who considered the process by which women might achieve liberation, even by way of violence. Um, so this feels much more of a processual book, um, whereas The Wanderground seemed more documentary. After gaining fame within the predominantly male world of science fiction writing with her 1968 Picnic on Paradise, her later work in The Female Man offered a particular prefigurative space for lesbian feminists to envision the work ahead of them for staging utopia. It's a term I borrow from Jose Esteban Munoz. The worlds of Joanna Russ's The Female Man are unstuck from static locations in a timeline and interwoven with one another to paint a trans-temporal picture of feminist consciousness. Defined by its defiantly nonlinear structure and complex intermingling of four women's lives across different utopian and dystopian universes, the female man engages in a chaotic exercise and exploration, commingling violent pasts with safe futures. And this is, this is a really fun book to read, um, but can be frustrating if you're someone who really wants to follow a narrative closely, because um, the four like main characters' identities like tend to blur together, so it's often very unclear who's narrating. So in an early review of this book, this historian Dennis Livingston described the female man um, as a, a successful counteraction of science fiction's historic poor treatment of women. So he said, you know, there's no particular plot, the males are all stereotypes, the women move through set pieces, but none of that matters in the face of the bitter reality spelled out and the vision offered. The reality is that women's place in society as we know it is an intolerable condition of continual denial of selfhood for the gratification of male egos. The vision is what women could do on their own with no role restrictions, namely anything, anything at all. This, this we see as the feminist anarchistic utopia of while away, a future earth inhabited only by women with its steering lessons for our own time and place. So as Livingston, Livingston suggests, um, the ideal depicted in Janet's world, one of the main characters, while away, represents a space where Russ and other feminists could imagine and explore a future in which women are no longer subjected to the quotidian violence of patriarchy. It is a day-to-day -day ongoing um, structure of violence. So while away is inherently anti-capitalist and its residents have successfully dissolved the problematic structure of the nuclear family a call of many lesbian feminists, in favor of a more diffuse system of kinship. And while away, there are no men, the work week is 16 hours total, and children are allowed to travel as they please until they turn 17 and enter the workforce for just a few years and they can transition to doing whatever they want. Families often consist of 30 or more people linked through networks of kinship, but with space for fluidity of relationships. Most explicitly, while away is a space where women are free from the structured totality of patriarchal surveillance. As Janet describes it, there's no being out too late in while away or up too early or in the wrong part of town or unescorted. You can't fall out of the kinship web and become sexual prey for strangers where there is no prey and there are no strangers. The web is worldwide. In all of while away, there's no one who will keep you from going from where you please, though you may risk your life if that sort of thing appeals to you. No one who will follow you and try to embarrass you by whispering obscenities in your ear. No one will attempt to assault you. No one who will warn you of the dangers of the street. No one who will stand on street corners, hot-eyed and vicious, jingling loose change in his pants pocket, bitterly, bitterly sure that you're a cheap woozy, hot and wild, who loves it, who can't say no, who's making a mint off of it, who inspires him with nothing but disgust and who wants to drive him crazy. 
Here, Russ integrates many of the concerns from a long list of grievances articulated by her contemporaries in the 1970s, imagining a world not too distant from her own in which these possibilities could play out. So in The Female Man, there are four main characters, Joanna, Janine, Janet, and Yael, and they're actually each manifestations of the same person who live in four separate universes, one of which is the 1970s as Joanna Russ lived in it. Um, but because they, I guess the argument of the book structure is that for one person can't be in four places at once. So each of them both are the same person and are different people at the same time. And they share a consciousness with one another that they become more aware of um, through the book. Um, and in sort of Joanna, the character's case um, in the 1970s, um, the backdrop is a, a, her being part of feminist organizing that's under like extreme government surveillance, um, which many lesbian feminists have extensive FBI files uh, because you know they were being watched a lot of the time. So although much of this novel is devoted to the four characters' discovery of one another through this shared consciousness, it reaches a climax when the four women arrive in Janet's seeming, seeming utopian world of while away where men have ceased to exist. Despite the, the narrative that all the men died of a mysterious disease centuries prior, the women uncover that their departure was in fact the result of a mass extermination. After the shock of this revelation, Russ leaves her audience to ponder what this dystopian past means for our utopian understanding of Wow Away. The moment of horror Russ exposed in the closing conflict of the female man serves as evidence of the settler colonial impulse in some lesbian utopian thinking. Radical visions with the goal of producing a world without men often conceal or fail to consider the means of that production, obfuscating the genocidal tendencies of projects that rely upon extermination of a class rather than a work than broader work against colonization. The imagined worlds of lesbian feminism often serve as a refuge for settler colonial thinking, as in material, the material land-based projects they both chronicled and inspired. So um, to return briefly to my comparison of um, Gilman's Herland and Gerhardt's Wanderground, there's an unspoken uh, racist aspect of lesbian utopian thinking that nearly always also presumes racial homogeneity, homogeneity where the membership of the post-racial ideal is some commonly understood to be white. Um, within this logic, the possibility of a future is foreclosed to non-white actors, rendering the dystopian underpinnings of so-called utopian visions exposed. And to quote Sharon, the wonderful Sharon Holland uh, from here at UNC here in her um, book, The Erotic Life of Racism, um, this disappearance uh, of the um, black lesbian body specifically is necessary to a certain mode of queer theorizing that can't account for itself without that body's erasure even in this precise moment of absolutely recognizing it and inscribing it. So these are two, um, two novels that are often viewed as, to summarize it, lesbian feminist utopia. Um, but I think both of them themselves are also a little bit self-conscious, uh, especially in the case of Joanna Russ, of the underpinning nightmare um, that sort of creates the conditions for production of this utopian imaginary. Um, so in the full spirit of being our full embodied selves, if, if this is a moment we need to take a break and stretch, um, go on ahead and do that. So I wanna talk about one more novel here, and this is one that is not often considered alongside lesbian feminist literature. Um, Octavia Butler was a lesbian and a feminist writing at the same time and drawing from some of the same issues that Joanna Russ and Sally Miller Gearhart are talking about. Um, but she's, often thought about outside of this canon. But I think that talking about kindred in particular here is really useful um, for understanding the place of dystopia in some of these worlds. So in, in talking about the previous two novels, there have been some sort of suggestions of sexual violence. Um, but I do want to give a content note here for kindred that um, I'm not going to go into any specific descriptions. But if, uh, if you know, you're feeling uncomfortable and need to step away and take a minute, um, please do that, because that kind of content will be in this section. So Octavia Butler's 1979 novel, Kindred, provides a poignant example of the possibilities of expanding 
what counts in the composition of lesbian feminist utopian thinking. In Kindred, Butler forces readers to reckon with the ways the legacy of enslavement still underlies ongoing struggles, manifesting itself through our very family lineages. Over the course of the novel, we experience the main character, Dana's, journey toward a level of consciousness that allows her to refuse and escape the control of a male figure, a distant relative from far back in her lineage who seeks to make her a victim of his forced sexual conquest through rape. Kindred begins in 1976, the United States Bicentennial. Dana has just turned 26 and has moved to a new home in LA with her husband, Kevin. Dana expresses that both of their families have expressed some disdain toward their relationship. She's a younger black woman. Kevin is a white man in his uh, 40s. But nonetheless, they have like, tried to build a calm and supportive life with one another. Um, and they're working, when the novel begins, as a team unpacking boxes before going into their respective writing spaces. So the seeming tranquility of Dana's life changes immediately when she's sucked back in time to the aid of Rufus Whalen, a four-year-old child of an enslaver in Antebella, Maryland, who's on the verge of drowning in a nearby stream. Dana rushes in to save Rufus, pulling him out of the water just as his white mother approaches in a fit of rage. Just as matters begin to intensify, Dana is sucked back to 1976, where only a few moments have passed. This instance is the first of six involuntary journeys back in time to save Rufus for Dana. Over the course of the novel, Dana learns that Rufus is one of her ancestors, and so, so too is young Alice Greenwood, one of the people he enslaves. On each occasion that she's sucked back in time to Rufus's aid, he's aged several years and become more deeply invested in his role as an enslaver and forceful in his relationship with Alice, with whom he played as a child and has become determined to assault as an adult. Dana also fell party to the intensification of this relationship. The instructive relationship she had with Rufus as a child evaporated as he aged, whereby he began the process of enslaving her too. As Dana is called back to Rufus's aid over and over again, she's forced to reckon with the question of whether or not to forego protecting him. Should she allow him to die, she protects the ancestors he and his family enslaves, but risks her own annihilation. So what she's talking, what she's thinking and considering here is um, whether or not she can ensure her own place in the future and at what cost. So should she protect him and allow him to live? She, on the other hand, she facilitates the assault of her ancestor, Alice, and reopen, but still reopens the possibility of her own existence. The questions faced by Dana are reminiscent of the processes described by theorist Hortense Spillers in her germinal essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. As Spillers argues, during the process of enslavement, African women in particular were subjected to a theft of the body during which they were dehumanized by their enslaver or discursively. The stolen body be then becomes a vestibule for violence that can be used for whatever purpose the captor desires, for rage, for rape, for labor. Enslavement further dislocates the captive person from systems of kinship in stark contrast to the endless kinship network, network described by Russ in her utopian while away. In her forced reentry into her lineage through time travel and through her subjection to the same disarticulation from body into flesh, Dana is forced to reckon with the violence of her creation and what place she'll have in it. During her final journey back in time, Dana becomes trapped for longer than ever before, increasingly fearful that she'll be forced to eventually forego her resistance and submit to a life in slavery. In her most recent episode, an increasingly violent Rufus has forced Alice to become his concubine, and as a result, she has borne several children from his acts of rape. At the novel's climax, Dana kills Rufus as he attempts to assault her. As Dana narrates, I realized how easy it would be for me to continue to be still and forgive him even this. So easy in spite of all my talk, but it would be so hard to raise the knife, to drive it into the flesh I had saved so many times, so hard to kill. I could feel the knife in my hands, still slippery with perspiration. A slave was a slave. Anything could be done to her. I could accept him as my ancestor, my younger brother, my friend, but not as my master and not as my lover. In this moment of 
and reckoning, Dana chooses refusal, a refusal to allow her submission to become absolute, a refusal to be mastered, and refusal to evacuate her body for Rufus's pleasure. She reclaims her body from captivity, but not without paying a price. Dana stabs Rufus before returning to 1976, where she learns she has been physically marked by the experience, losing her arm after she rematerializes with it trapped inside of one of the walls of her home. Dana later discovers that her ancestors were able to escape the plantation with a written pass after burning the house down to destroy the evidence of Rufus's murder leaving no physical trace of the violence that befell her there in the past. So unlike the characters in The Female Man, Dana doesn't get to leave her own past or that of her family behind. Rather, she's forced to travel with it alongside her and marked upon her body. And in the end, Dana does not arrive at Utopia, but rather back in the dystopian world of 1976 in the United States. But I think there's a certain optimism still in Kindred. But Dana survives, is able to build her own future while recovering the past. It's also important to note that while the plot of Kindred represents an experience of dystopia for Dana, that same dystopian environment is very well considered utopic by those whose investments in white supremacy render the plantation a dreamscape rather than a nightmare. The horrors of Kindred underscore the necessity of taking care in utopian thinking to not steamroll the existence of the residues of the past by speculating toward a deracinated future, but rather in recognizing and grappling with the ways visions that might seem utopian are always tied to and inflected by the, by the present and the past, even as they're often so future looking. So I wanna end here with this, this idea of iterating utopia. Um, and I wanna ask, you know, what are we to do with all these dreams and nightmares, these utopian and dystopian vision, visions situated alongside and contoured against one, one, each other, one another, sort of mutually constitutive in their existence, and particularly in a moment where so, much of, so many of us are dreaming of a future where we can all be together again, perhaps something different from how we were before. Um, I think that these dreams and nightmares or these, these ideas really matter. And I, I do my best to be an option, optimist, uh, so I want to leave us here with this. I think it's easy to get off track trying to imagine something perfect and to get stuck, unable to start, uh, because we become so overwhelmed by how hard it will be to do the tremendous amount of work absolute perfection requires. And as I hope I've been able to demonstrate in the three novels, especially that I've brought with me to the conversation, even the most seemingly utopian future visions often exist in a broader landscape where dystopia is still possible. But as Fred Jameson reminds us in Archaeologies of the Future, the value of utopian visions lies not in their ability to be perfect, but rather in their ability to inspire future utopian visions in their wake. Thank you very much. And I'll be around for questions. Thank you so much. Can you hear the applause that is recorded? <laughs>